Hello Zero Books readers. In this video, I'll be presenting a defense of reason and universality and criticizing postmodernism. While there will be a couple of excerpts from Mark Fisher's books, Capitalist Realism and Ghosts of My Life, what I'll really use to illustrate my argument are the television programs Bojack Horseman and the NBC philosophical comedy The Good Place. Let's start with Mark Fisher. While Fisher was not a Marxist, and while he was interested in some supposedly Derridian concepts, such as ontology, his relationship with the father of deconstruction was ambivalent. In his book, Ghosts of My Life, for instance, he wrote that he, quote, generally found Jacques Derrida to be a frustrating thinker. The philosophical project, which Derrida founded, installed itself as a pious cult of indeterminacy, which, at its worst, made a lawyerly virtue of avoiding any definitive claim. Deconstruction was a kind of pathology of skepticism, which induced hedging, infirmity of purpose, and compulsory doubt in its followers. What Fisher claimed as an initial impression, I want to take up as a legitimate judgment. To the extent that deconstruction can be distinguished from philosophical skeptics, critical theorists of scientific liberalism, and political radicals who aimed at developing a ruthless critique of the world with the aim of changing it, it can be understood as the way the academy conformed to the demands of a post-Fordist society, or from a French perspective, as the bad aftertaste of the May 1968 pseudo-revolution. So here we are. Four students are getting the ax, six organizations are getting the ax, for standing up this semester and for fighting for these things. While workers and students around the world, as Fisher put it in Capitalist Realism, quote, sought after an emancipation from Fordist routine, end quote, that is, from a form of capitalism that operated through factories and trade unions, contracts and pensions, national economies defined by mass production, consumerism, and the welfare state, what their rebellion led to was the development of what we now understand as neoliberalism. Again, from Fisher's book, it was easy for the advocates of post-Fordist capital to present themselves as the opponents of the status quo, bravely resisting an inertial organized labor, pointlessly invested in fruitless ideological antagonism. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. The turn away from structuralism in the academy emerged alongside a rejection of a structuralist understanding of economic inequality. Rather than understanding various forms of inequality as developing out of the capitalist production, neoliberals argued that those who would play God with the market in an effort to rectify inequities were only making things worse. Derrida and his followers likewise rejected universalist concepts of power and society in favor of a method of deconstruction that would fragment our ideas in order to exclude totalization, which was the evil that was itself responsible for oppression inequity, and ideological confusion. To explain postmodernism this way, however, is not entirely justifiable. Derrida was not an ideologue or propagandist working in the service of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. He was a serious philosopher. Earlier, I said we could consider the project of deconstructionism to be the philosophical handmaiden of neoliberalism if we thought of it as something altogether separate from earlier philosophical and political traditions. However, we need not think of postmodern deconstruction in that way at all. Deconstruction of the subject is first, uh, among other things, uh, the, ana the, the genealogical analysis of the trajectory through which the concept has been built, uh, used, uh, uh, legitimized and so on and so forth. In, uh, to say just a few words about, about this tradition, what we call a subject 
uh, was first in, let's say, the Aristotelian tradition, the hypokaimenon, the substance, something which is underneath, identical to itself, and different from the different proprieties, qualities, uh, attributes. It is the, uh, the center of an identity. Uh, from the Aristotelian tradition, then to Cartesian tradition, the ego cogito, and then the, uh, the Kantian, Kantian I think, the, uh, when Kant says, the I think, ich denke, must accompany all my representations, and whatever uh, experience I, I, I have or I make, it is referred to a subject, to the, an I who says, which says, or uh, I, I, and the I is supposed to be the subject identical to itself and uh, always intact under all circumstances in every culture, in every different empirical context. If we take Derrida up as a philosopher, as just another thinker wrestling with major ideas developed out of what is nowadays referred to as the Western philosophical tradition, we can see that Derrida offers us, at least in the clip we just saw, an epistemological critique of ontology. He claims that what we take to be a positive thing, a presence, is in fact only an historical coalescence of often contradictory concepts. What we believe to be a given meaning is in fact always a plurality of meanings. What we take to be true for all time is only a truth that is developed through time. For Derrida, even the notion that we exist as thinking individuals who can assess concepts should be doubted, as the I in Descartes' I think, therefore I am, is just as questionable, just as socially dependent, and finally, just as problematic as any other concept. As to Cartesian problem, I'm always a faithful Cartesian because I claim that we should distinguish the mistake is at the very beginning of Descartes when he makes this fateful step from cogito ergo sum, which is a purely performative evental entity. Cogito is just a process of cogito, totally non-substantial. The step from here to res cogitans, to a thing which, thing which thinks, is illegitimate. But the lesson of all radical modern philosophers, Descartes, Kant, Hegel, is no, our, the wealth of our personality is just a mask. There is a void there. Contrary to what sometimes Michel Foucault seems to claim and so on, I think that this transcendental tradition of modern philosophy is absolutely anti-humanist. It's not human being. The wealth of human being is the mask of a void. Another way to understand what Derrida is getting at and whether there is a way to return to a reductionist critique of the totality rather than a fragmented critique of everything, is to take up Max Horkheimer's book, The Eclipse of Reason. In it, Max describes how enlightenment reason is unjustifiably totalizing. He prefigures postmodernity and deconstruction by tracing how reason itself leads to irrationality and barbarism. According to Max, pre-modern reason was objective. At the risk of oversimplifying, let's say that objective reason is a reason that searches for the truth with a capital T. The aim of objective reason is to discover something outside of ourselves, something either in the world or in the heavens, that once discovered will provide a comprehensive meaning to our lives and direct us on how to live. Subjective reason, on the other hand, is thinking in the service of the self. In the modern world, almost all reason is subjective, in so much as it is concerned with utility and with what is good for humans. What's worse than subjective reason's selfishness is that while starting with the aim of liberating humanity from oppressive, totalizing systems of universal meaning, it inevitably ends up breaking with meaning altogether by placing the self-interest of the powerful at the center. What starts as subjective reason, based on the inherent value and meaning of every individual human life, becomes a hollow instrumental reason that stamps out human meaning altogether. Derrida's deconstruction 
is the form instrumental reason takes when it can no longer justify itself and must, thereby, declare that nothing can ever be justified. It is what we're left with when the project of the Enlightenment reaches what appears to be a dead end. However, we might hold on to a bit of hope, as both the hopelessness of neoliberal deconstruction and the possibility for a radical continuation of philosophy are, quite literally, in the air. They are both, I think, being televised on programs such as BoJack Horseman and The Good Place. As other YouTubers and commenters have noted, BoJack Horseman subverts the narrative form. The story of BoJack is not a story with a moral or an aim. It is instead a plotted out commentary on the uselessness of such stories. BoJack is a horse and a washed up Hollywood actor who became famous on a 90s sitcom about a surrogate family. That show called Horsin' Around was a televisual spectacle that presented a world where social harmony was possible, where the problems that the characters had to solve could be resolved in 30 minutes, and most of all, where some sort of resolution and meaning to life was still ready to hand, even if that meaning was saccharine and vapid. Bojack Horseman's real life, on the other hand, is a chaotic mess, held together only by his unjustifiable fame and money. He is a character without a moral center and without a name. His life doesn't amount to a single story, but rather to a series of incidents rendered as jokes, as moments of sorrow, as uncomfortable pauses, as betrayals, as debauchery, and as a Netflix original. As the showrunner Raphael Bob Waxberg said in an interview with Verge back in 2015, quote, I don't believe in endings. Like you can have the worst day of your life, but then the next day won't be the worst day of your life. And I think it works in a positive and a negative. All these things that happen are moments in time. We've kind of internalized this idea that we're working toward some great ending and that if we all put our ducks in a row, we'll be rewarded and everything will finally make sense. But the answer is that everything doesn't make sense, at least as far as I've found. Bojack Horseman is a character who is weighed down by his past mistakes and who is constantly striving after some elusive happiness, but he is also a character who barely learns and constantly repeats. He makes the same decisions again and again. He is motivated by the same selfishness, and what's worse, is that he's just self-aware enough to know this and to hate himself for it. What he doesn't realize is that the ending he's striving for isn't off in the future, but is already there in his present. That is, what he doesn't see is how it's really impossible to be aimless, even if it's also impossible to fully achieve any given aim. He realizes that his subjective quest after meaning is precisely what is emptying his life of meaning and, more to the point, of happiness. But he can't do anything about it. He has no alternative aim beyond serving himself. In The Good Place, on the other hand, the character's story starts after the moment of their death. They have already reached the end that Bob Waxberg claims not to believe in. All of the little moments, getting married, getting divorced, starring in a sitcom, betraying your best friend to keep the job, getting ensnared in a drug habit. All of this has already happened to them. Their lives are over. Their experiences have been added up, analyzed, and scored. The theorist Max Horkheimer once wrote, that bourgeois thought either deplores the meaninglessness of the whole or submits to the inscrutability of God's ways. What's most radical about The Good Place is that the characters and their story do neither thing. When they understand that they are already at the end, that the world they live in is a part of a system that produces outcomes, that sets up a telos or aim, they can no longer find the world meaningless nor can they accept the world of their afterlife as merely mysterious, inscrutable, or unknowable. 
Ultimately, they themselves began to render judgment on both the world as they knew it while they were alive and on their afterlife, or their end. Oh, oh this is the bad place! Rather than being meaningless or mysterious, the world in the good place is broken. It is badly designed. It is systematically dysfunctional. If there is the, the crucial point of modern ontology, it's the idea of, as I repeat all the time, of incomplete universe. You know, this idea that reality is not fully ontologically constructed, that the world is not fully out there. The good place, it seems to me, is an attempt to overcome the objection that Horkheimer, and in a different way, Derrida, both raised against the Enlightenment and reason with a capital R. These characters return to philosophy, not with the hope that they can find some objective truth to guide them. The objective truth of the world is that there is a wibbly-wobbly and really insane system for judging utility and intentions that sorts people into either the good or the bad place. Instead, they turn to reason out of a desire to improve their own behavior, not in order to line up with the objective facts, nor to save themselves, but simply because the alternative to this self-improvement is absurdity, chaos, and destruction. There are no guarantees for these dead characters. There is no prepared way out. There is only their subjective reason, but it is relatively selfless, as they set off in pursuit not of truth, but a process of understanding. Thanks for watching this Zero Books video. If you enjoyed it, you might click on that subscribe button and the bell. You might also consider supporting us on Patreon. We're now offering patrons access to select Zero Books titles and the opportunity to join in a monthly Zero Books Club discussion group online.